Hey guys, how you doing? JP Sarri Colia here. And as many of you know, we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of Image Comics, a company that has shaped the way we perceive comics for the past 30 years. An amazing ride for sure. So many great characters, many great series. So in this video, I want to pay homage to what the company has done for the past 30 years. I recently spoke about it on my podcast. I really share what I consider the legacy and the cultural impact of this company. But in this video, I want to pay my respects by sharing with you what I consider the top 10 series of the past 30 years. Ongoing series, maxi series, so um, no mini series, no limited series. So anything that is less than 25 issues, we're not going to include in this video. I will probably have a separate video for that. But in this video, also, I want to mention this. I want to set some rules. We're not going to include anything that started on a, on a different publisher. So we're not going to include Kick-Ass, which is created by Mark Miller and John Romita Jr. That started at Icon, in, the Icon imprint from Marvel. Criminal, also from Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips, that also started at Icon imprint. So unfortunately, it's not going to be included on this list. Hack and Slash from Tim Silly, that started at Devil's Due Publishing. Also, we're not going to include any of the Waston properties. So the Wildcast, Gen 13, we're not going to include them here, unfortunately, because they're now they're owned by DC and uh, they were sold back in 1999. Uh, we're not gonna include Danger Girl. Of course, it moved to DC with, when, with Wildstorm and then uh, now it's on the hands of IDW, the publishing rights. We're not gonna include Tomb Raider, which started with Top Cow Productions. Now it's on the hands of Dark Horse Comics. The Pit, which is an amazing run from the 90s. I love it. The Max, uh, we're not gonna include those. They, they are in other places. Uh, and one one that really hurts me to mention here, Fear Agent, Rick Remender's Fear Agent, we're not gonna include it on the list because even though it, it started at Image Comics, it left for Dark Horse Comics for nine years and now it's back. But for, for the longest, it, it was published by Dark Horse Comics. So those are not gonna be included on this list. Number 10, Monstrous by Marjorie Liu, and Sana Takeda. This has 36 issues so far, still an ongoing series, started back in 2015. The reason why I included this one, and I know it can be controversial because a lot of people are not really fans of this book, is because this, up to this point, is one of the highest awarded comic book series, uh, pretty much from Image Comics of all time. Uh, it has received not only some of the most prestigious awards from, you know, the, the Harvey Awards, the Eisner Awards, also has a Hugo Awards, has won Bram Stoker Awards, the British Fantasy Awards. So it has gotten so many awards. And to be honest with you, it's not as bad as some people think it is. It is a dense book. It is a dark epic fantasy saga, which I love those type of books. If you're a big fan of things like Game of Thrones or you're a fan of The Witcher, a lot of influence from manga, has influence from anime, has influence even from JRPGs. Also has a little bit of hint of like a Guilty Gear, Blaze Blue. It's a very dense book. It's written like a novel, but the art of Takeda is so amazing. You know, the covers are amazing. Now, this is the story of Micah Halfwolf, a teenage girl who shares a bond with an ancient monster, an ancient, very powerful, very mysterious monster. There's a war in the world between the Arcanics, who are descendants of special beings, gods. Some of them, they have like this animal form and they're fighting against humanity. So it's the humans versus the Arcanics. And she's in between. She's in the middle because she's also an Arcanic. And, you know, there's so much political intrigue. There's a lot of density here. There's a lot of teams that are really... You know, it sometimes can go over your head if you're not really prepared for it. If you're not used to this type of literature, then definitely it's going to be really hard for you sometimes to understand or keep up and you might find it boring. But if you really pay attention, you know, you really go there. There's so much mystery unraveling and every person has a motive and everyone has secrets. And there's something that is really interesting about the story. For me, what really keeps the story grounded is Kipa, who is a young girl who... Pierce, she, this is an arcanic, she looks like a fox. And she is a very, has a good heart, she's very friendly, she follows uh, Micah everywhere she goes. You have Ren the Necromancer, who is a cat, who is very funny, but also he has a lot of secrets. So they keep the thing grounded and they bring those moments that are more, there's more relief, there's comedic relief there. I like it. I think that it has its moments. It's not a perfect story, still developing. There's so much stuff that's still unraveling in the story. It's a more modern take of things but it's really taking image into a new direction. So for that reason, it's included here. Number nine, Chew from John Lehman and Rob Guillory. Now, let me tell you one thing. This is such a funny book. It is a funny, funny book. And this is something some normally strange from Image Comics because most of the stuff that they produce, is always dready. It's always like, you know, hard and dark and moody. 
This is not. This is on the opposite side. It's so funny. It's so self-aware at the same time. There's so much dark humor here, but it's there's recurring jokes from the first issue to the last. This started in 2009 and in 2016, there were some spin-offs that came out of it, like Chu, S-H-U, with 10 issues, and also there was another crossover, another three issues. So there's been some different things, but man, I'm telling you, it's so funny. Now, let me give you an idea of the story, just if you are unfamiliar. This is the story of Anthony Chu. Anthony Chu is an FDA, you heard it right, Food and Drug Administration agent. After the catastrophe of a, the, an outbreak of the bird flu, 23 million Americans die and many other many millions around the world. So the world has come into a lockdown. I'm just kind of familiar where, you know, chicken is forbidden. Nobody can eat chicken. So the FDA becomes the most important uh, organization or agency in the United States to protect the life of Americans by always trying to look because people are contravanding chicken to try to eat chicken because people love chicken. So it's funny. And the, the thing about Anthony is that not only he's an agent, he's a psychopath. That means that he, whatever he eats, whatever he puts in his mouth, he can get a psychic reading of whatever happened in the past of that particular object. So he can read, you know, food, bad food, whatever he puts in his mouth and also human parts. That gives him an, an understanding of things. The whole concept is stupid, sounds stupid. But once you really get into it, it's so funny. And the jokes are all over the place. There's so many memorable characters here. You know, it, it really talks about family. It talks about, you know, the importance of friendship and doing the right thing. So it has a lot of those themes, you know, with, with the dark humor, which is amazing. And also there is an USDA, the Department of Agriculture, Super Agent Pojo, which is a rooster. And he's a ninja, he's a master assassin. It's an amazing, I'm telling you, it's so funny that you need to read it. This is totally different than anything that image has done. And it's very unique and there's nothing really to compare it with. And it's an amazing run for sure. Number eight, East of West by Jonathan Hickman and Nick Dragota. I'm telling you one thing, if I don't mention this here, people are gonna be upset with me for the right reasons. Because this is perhaps the magnum opus of Jonathan Hickman's career. It's so good, it is really good. And I will tell you, Hickman has a problem that is always well known, particularly in his own work, not necessarily in the stuff that he has done for, for Marvel, for example, but is that he has, his characterization is not that good. You know, the characters, he, he, he centers primarily on the plot. So everything he does is plot driven rather than character driven. So this is no exception here. It's such a big event, everything is happening so fast. There's so many characters and so many of those characters get lost in the process. But the way he handled the whole story, the whole event, the whole teams that he is trying to portray here, politics that are involved here, he talks about religion, he talks about so many different aspects, and it's so, so good. Now, to give you an idea, if you're unfamiliar with East of West, this is pretty much a dystopian future, uh, you know, pretty much ready for the apocalypse. In a world from America is divided into different nations, and every nation represents actually different races, different people which is an interesting, uh, very clever way to do it. And of course, it's a dystopian future. This is sci-fi elements, which are amazing. And the art really portrays everything in a really amazing way. From the Force Horseman of the Apocalypse, Dead decides to quit the job because he falls in love with a woman and he has a child and he decides to save his family. And he decides just not to continue with the plans of the apocalypse. And of course, he's chased now by the other members of the Horsemen. And there is, of course, a group of people that they're believing in the end of times and they're trying to go after the end of times. So, of course, there's a lot of religious teams here. It's so interesting. There's so much war. There's so much stuff. The R really evolves in the way everything is portrayed. It's so good. In so many ways, I feel that the R, Dragota, really takes elements even from, I would say, I don't know, like, Brave Star, the, the animated cartoon that was amazing back in the 80s. I love the way he does the art. It's so, so good. And yes, it is not perfect, but the whole event, the way everything starts and how it ends, and ultimately the message that the whole story is about love and about hope in the middle of difficult times. It's such a good story. If you have never read it, you need to read it. It's really fantastic. Number seven, Lazarus by Greg Rocca and Michael Lark. I'm telling you, it's an amazing run. Started back in 2013, it's still ongoing. This is such an amazing series for sure. And the reason why I put it above East of West is because there's a big difference between the way Rocka writes and Hickman. Hickman, you know, as I mentioned, he's not good at characterizing characters, you know, he lacks on that aspect, but Rocka is the opposite. He gives a lot of personality to each character 
and motivation. And that to me is one of the best aspects of his writing. Now, this is a dystopian science fiction. The world has been divided among 16 families who, which operate like mafias. And the Lazarus are protectors of those families. They're like the, and sometimes cybernetically enhanced, who are the military leaders and pretty much the bodyguards of the families, of the, pretty much the top families. And this is the story of Forever Carlisle. Forever is one of those Lazarus. Of course, she's a member, a part of the family, of the Carlisle family. But there's a lot of secrets around her. Even though those secrets are spelled to you, they're presented to you from the beginning, she is unaware of those things. And she has to find out. Now, this is a coming-of-age story for sure. And I'm telling you, it explores the meaning of humanity, what it means to be human, family, the concept of nature versus nurture, and the power of manipulation. It has a lot, it has politics, you know, because Rock has never been afraid to express his political views. So it's really well done. Uh, sometimes it might be slow, but it's just character development, which I love, but it really reads really well. It really fast and definitely the art. Lark's art is amazing. It looks so realistic. This was planned to be a TV show at some point, still in plans, in talks, but we haven't heard. It will be a fantastic TV show for sure. It is a really good story, one of the best at Image Comics. Number six, Saga by Brian K. Vaughn and Fiona Staples. This is a phenomenal run. It started back in 2012, 55 issues. There was a three year hiatus. It just got back. We just have issue number 55 and there's plans for more. People love Saga, has won more awards, in this case, more Harvey and more uh, Eisner Awards than any other on this list. An epic space opera, fantasy adventure, heavily influenced by Star Wars, Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, and Romeo and Juliet. It's pretty much all of those things combined. It's very mature. There's nudity here. There's a lot of things that happen here. But it's a love story. It's a love story of Elena and Marco, who are members or are part of two different extraterrestrial uh, races that fall in love while the universe is at war. The galaxies at war and they fall in love with each other and they have a daughter named Hazel. And sometimes Hazel narrates the story. There's drama, there's, you know, comedy. The art, of course, of Staples is fantastic. It, it, the book explores the power of love. That's, I think, the main, the central foc uh, focal point here. It, the power of family, also the race relationships, politics, explores the human condition. It explores a lot of things. Of course, there's a lot of magical elements, but also sci-fi elements. It's a combination of so many great things and so many great characters. It's very mature again. You know, there's a lot of heavy language here. And for most of these books, it's going to be heavy language. But to be honest, it's really a fantastic book that you need to explore. There's some heartbreak. There's moments that are really hard to swallow. Situations that are unexpected. People die. But it's a really fantastic collection and one that definitely deserves to be on this list. If, you know, this for perhaps is more than any other on the list. Number five. And now I'm going to go old school on this one. Witchblade and the Darkness. You know, this, of course, they were created by Mark Silvestri, David Wall, uh, Brian Haberlin, and Michael Turner. And this was done under Top Cow Productions. And I'm telling you, I'm going old school because I love the Witchblade. And... I know some people will say, well, why you put Witchblade above Saga and all this? It's because, to be honest, yes, we love Saga, and Saga is something that has done amazing, but before all this new collection, before all these new runs, Witchblade was already there, and Witchblade was very mature from the get-go. And, of course, you're talking about 203 issues so far, and so many uh, crossovers and spin-offs and things that happen, of course, you know, that's just for the Witchblade. Now, you're talking about the Darkness, 180 issues over all these years since started what since 1995 1996 that's when everything started this series follows the life of nypd homicide detective zara Pacini, who becomes the bearer of the witchblade gauntlet an ancient sentient weapon now the premises are cheesy i gotta be honest with you but they're really cool of course this is in the 90s and it has developed and evolved over the years of course it doesn't have the same literary value perhaps of east of west or saga but I'm telling you, it's fun. And the 90s was fun. The art of Michael Turner was fun. And the things that they did here, they were really, really fun. It was more mature for anything that even Marvel was doing at the time. So it was really, really well done. We have seen, of course, this had been developed into other things, where there was the TV show, uh, the manga, the anime, the games based on the darkness. Now, the darkness is the life of Jackie Staccato, who was introduced in, uh, in the Witchblade number 10. And he's an NYC mafioso. You know, he's a, a tough guy. And he was an, an anti-hero, a very brutal anti-hero. 
but of course he became so popular he grew to have his own run and people love the darkness too you know and of course the darkness is always involved in this battle between light and, and darkness he represents chaos and he you know in this case fights angelus who represents the light so there's a lot of you know things that are happening here a lot of powerful beings a lot of enigma a lot of you know curses and a lot of darkness and things that I definitely is not not for everyone but there's no denying that witchblade was a pillar of top cow productions which is you know pretty much an imprint of image comics it was a pillar and it continues to be a pillar so that's the reason why it's so impactful and it's included on this list number four invincible by robert kirkman and corey walker now it's important to point out that ryan Utley did most of the art uh for, you know for most of the series and this is of course is part of skybound entertainment which is another imprint of image comics now there are a total of about 145 issues plus multiple guest appearances you know between 2002 and 2018 now, I still remember when this came out, I wasn't like I blown away by Invincible. I remember I was back in reading comics when that when that actually this comic was uh, becoming very popular at the beginning of the, the run. And, you know, people were talking good about it and I read it and I didn't find it really like crazy because it was more like a teenage drama in some ways. But I'm telling you, the story evolved over time. I kept reading it and I've been reading pretty much I've read it all. It's the story of Mark Grayson, the son of Omni Man, who is an extraterrestrial very super powerful hero uh, who is part of uh, the Viltrumat race and he is and the whole thing with Mark is that he's a teenager who inherits the powers of his dad and there's a lot of secrets and of course you have watched the show there's a lot of they already tackle all those things from the beginning it's that the construction of superheroes it's that the construction of the Superman classic tale it's a coming of age story with Mark the way that he changes from being a teenager a kid into becoming a man that is carrying the same powers of his dad this is the thing. The great thing about Invincible with the S has been is it's always been fun from the beginning. Yeah, it started slow. Once it gained momentum, it went pretty much all out. And that's something that is very good about the story. And I'm glad that now it's be being popular and people still love Invincible. It's a fantastic universe. And definitely Invincible was, you know, he was participating with so much stuff in Image to the point that has become one of the most influential characters, which is good. Definitely, this is the reason why it's included here. Number three, The Walking Dead by Robert Kirkman and Tony Moore. It's important to mention that Charlie Adlar has been the one that has drawn most of the book for pretty much almost in its entirety. This started, what, in 2003 and ended in 2019, 193 issues, a very long run. Now, one thing that we have to mention about The Walking Dead, not only because it was an instant sensation in comics. It was in a time where Image was struggling trying to find their footing and trying to find something totally different. And there was a time, technically, The Walking Dead started the whole zombie apocalypse type of thing. Many copycats came in the aftermath. Many people wanted to follow, even in Image comics. But there's no other like The Walking Dead. There's no other. The way they did it, the way they started, and it's not the new thing. They took a for inspiration from a lot of the stuff from the, the 70s films and horror films and zombie films and even the comics from that, the, the, the 60s and 70s, they took a lot of inspiration from that. Rick Grimes, a Kentucky deputy who awakens from a coma in a zombie apocalypse. And in the whole process, he's in search of his family. He's trying to save his family. He joins some survivors and then he becomes, uh, little by little, becomes the leader of this group, of this community. And of course, amazing in black and white, you know, if you don't love black and white, I'm you know, this is perfect the way it was done. And the series explores so many aspects, you know, the concepts that also the even though the show kind of takes some of that, it doesn't really take everything that happened in the book, some things they skip, but explores the concepts of love, family, moral duty, uh, it also dives into politics, into the race relationships. It talks about the nature of the human condition and the most important question uh, yeah, I think it, it really asks from the beginning, from the get-go, it's like at the end of the rope, how far are we willing to go in order to survive? That's the question that the book presents. Whether you're a fan of this type of comic books or, or not, it, there's no denying that the impact, the cultural impact that th this book has, has become one of the most important stories for Image Comics. One of the, it is the most recognizable. Number two, The Savage Dragon by Eric Larson. Now, why I conclude this? Because some people will say, yeah, I've seen so many top 10 lists and people are not including the Savage Dragon. And I don't know why they don't do that. Because the Sa Savage Dragon is such an iconic part of Image Comics. It has been since the, since 1992, when it was one of the first two, right next to Spawn, they were the first two that were introduced. Uh, and 
since then it's been you know pretty much on, on the stand you know for what 100 261 issues so far and everything only one issue wasn't drawn by eric larson but everything else has been written and drawn by eric larson that is amazing now this character is pretty much a love letter from eric larson it's been he created this character back in the 80s 1982 uh first appearance was in graphic uh fantasy number one which was a fan scene that you know he was actually the one in charge also then he appeared as the savage dragon at omega to number three back in 1986 so there were just appearances that, that he had but of course he has his own run when as soon as he created he was part of the creation of image comics he he went with it and he ran with it and he's been running with it for forever now you're not familiar with the savage dragon he's an amnesia he's a terrestrial superhero that has a dragon fin and he becomes a chicago police officer he's fighting all these powerful super villains and craziness it's a very mature book of course there's a lot of things here there were some nudity you know there's sex there's language you know there's there's that you know people dying there's some gore all the elements it was such a important and impactful thing i remember when i read it the first time the first issue that i still own i was like man i'm in love with this one this is really really good and of course he has partnered with so many heroes and anti-heroes and people from the image universe he's been involved there's so many you know characters that they're really likable you have the the his partner which is alex Weil. they have some type of love relationship at the beginning uh you have his wife maxine dragon he gets married he has children one of them is malcolm dragon who now carries the same legacy of his father you had a stepdaughter also there the super patriot man i'm telling you it was it was crazy and yes he doesn't have the same literary value of some of the the, the the stories that i'm mentioning here some of the runs but believe me it's such a fun story and even from larson larson mentioned the reason why he created the dragon and the reason he keeps with the dragon this is pretty much created for those fans that grew up in the bronze age of comics the people that like myself that we grew up reading those comics those classic comics also in the 90s and we just wanted something more mature we just got tired of the kiddish stuff we wanted something more mature at the level that we're in and believe me it doesn't doesn't disappoint another thing larson explores everything he talks about politics in the comic book there's so much to intrigue so much fun the art and he has evolved as an artist over the years he's much better than he was many many years ago yes it's not perhaps at the same tune of some of the, the stories that you love but if you give it a chance if you at least see it from that perspective you're gonna have fun with it this is really a fun ride and number one is spawn by todd mcfarlane and i'm telling you one thing if i don't put spawn at the top of the list then shame on me because spawn is technically image comics you know spawn is the one that started the whole thing with others but it was spawn that sustained image comics even through the most difficult times this is the ultimate thing from image comics at this point it's at 326 issues since 1992 has brought so many different artists so many writers have participated with spawn some of the best of the best you know a special mention you can talk about greg capullo when he started he started there fantastic art you had angel medina philip tan simon kudransky carlo barberi in the art and you have many writers too some of the best of the best were there now if you're familiar with spawn perhaps you have seen the the art you have seen the movie all of that this is the story of al simon uh, he is from detroit and he's a highly decorated marine recon specialist a cia agent he's betrayed on a mission a special ops mission by his commanding officer and he gets killed he goes to hell and he meets the devil malibolia and it returns to earth because he makes a deal with the devil he returns to earth as the hell spawn and when he comes to earth he realizes that at five years has passed since his dead is his passing and now his wife is remarried to his best friend and has a daughter and of course you know he cannot go back to his life really a dark anti-hero that he really brings justice in the darker way like he goes and kills street thugs mafiosos you know like gangsters anything the like child rapists he he doesn't forgive them in any way he just kills them straight up in the most brutal ways and of course he's fighting you know cybernetic enemies he's fighting a lot of powerful entities you know like you know agents from heaven and hell all that so it's, it's just crazy it was crazy in the 90s still crazy today and but when you think about spawn and the influence that he has it's just it's just amazing pop culture he is so well known you can ask people on the street that don't read comics about if they know saga or if they know east of west and not oh, lasser they will tell you no i don't know any of that but if you tell them you ask him about spawn they will tell you that they know spawn because it's such an icon and that's the reason why it's number one on this list you know when you think about image comics the person the character that resembles and really represents everything image is spawn is the one and for that reason 
it is number one here. But before I go, my friends, I want to share with you some honorable mentions, some stories that didn't make the cut to the top 10, but still are so iconic and you must read at some point. You have Jupiter's Legacy by Mark Miller. Definitely the whole series you need to read. You have Elephant Man, one that doesn't get as much love as Richard Starkins, but it's an amazing run, 80 issues, fantastic, fantastic story. Descender and Ascender by Jeff Lemire and Dustin Guyon. I'm telling you, that's another one that deserves to be, to have a spot in your collection. Black Science by Rick Remender. Rick Remender has done so much stuff. I'm telling you for Image Comics, that is amazing. Deadly Class, one that is more recent and people are in love and definitely was almost at the top 10, but it didn't make the cut. But I'm telling you, Deadly Class is definitely still bringing so much fun. It is a really good story. Paper Girls by Brian K. Vaughn. It's not at the same level. I would say of Saga, but it's really, really good as well. Beard Right by Joshua Williamson. You love the more, you, you like Dungeons and Dragons, you're gonna love Beard Right. It's really, really fun. You have Gideon's Fall, if you're into the horror stuff. If you love, you know, the horror, also you have Revival by Tim Silly. Those are really good. And there's many, many more that I can include on this list. I so many, and they're skipping my mind on the Maxi series. It, it's just amazing. Image has done such an amazing job in the last 30 years in really creating a space for creators to express ideas and to bring their own creations to life. And they have done an amazing job. Sometimes some of the series are not as good. Sometimes they have failed, but now they're very powerful. Even though they don't have the same power of Marvel or DC, they have the attention of a lot of comic book readers because they're bringing such an amazing production every month. Some of the best stories, the ones that get in all the awards are just coming from them. This company is on a roll and definitely the future is really, really bright. I'm telling you, I love what they're doing. I'm really, I've been in love with them for 30 years, even through the ups and downs. And definitely I'm excited for whatever is to come. But what is your opinion, my friends? What do you think about my list? Do you agree with it? You disagree with it? Do you want to share your list on the comments? Let me know. I want to hear from you. What are you think? Wh wh who you think is the best of the best? Who you think deserves to be at the top? My friends, thanks for watching. God bless you. Take care. I will talk to you again. Bye-bye.